Hello, Matt. How are you doing? Thank you. Good. For How are being you? Virtually. So the Batman is finally, is finally coming to tears. It took a while, but it's coming to tears unless there's like an unknown comet approaching Earth or something. <laughs> but well, you know, it's like what they said when, when, we, when we briefly shut down, I was told that this was, you know, when the pandemic, we were shooting during the pandemic and suddenly it was, it yeah. was force majeure. So it would have to be force majeure, some, some, some act of God, right? Sure, sure, sure. So Batman itself has always been like very dark, but not necessarily Bruce Wayne, right? At least in the movies. So how interesting it was for you to like uh, uh, create this new version of Bruce Wayne that is so like uh, kind of gothic. He's, he's very kind of dysfunctional, right? He's not like the typical playboy. And then to discuss it with, with, with Robert Pattinson and to develop it even more. Sure. I mean, you know, what was what I really wanted to do, what I thought was exciting was to revisit the character in his early years so that his character had room to evolve. And so this idea of a younger Batman who was still figuring out what it meant to be Batman was acting in a way where he was not even fully aware of what was driving him. I mean, he'd like to think he's doing this to make the city better, but honestly, he he's acting in a mode of vengeance because he yeah. he's trying to uh, make sense of his life. He's never going to get over what happened to him when he was 10 years old. And so it's it's got a very personal drive in it, probably more so than he's aware of, so that the movie's meant to kind of bring him along in an awakening, so that by the end he has a he realizes he has to change. And as far as the Bruce Wayne part of it, I thought that there was an opportunity because we'd seen the Playboy version um, yeah. who drove the Maserati. I thought, well, you know, that makes total sense, but there's another kind of reaction that you could have, which would be like a member of a storied family like, you know, the Kennedys or like the Royals, you know, the British Royals, where like some tragedy happens and the weight of it all is too much. You want to withdraw from it. And I thought, well, why why wouldn't he just as much, you know, want to become like Howard Hughes and hide from the media and just not to go, go out? You know, if, if that had happened to you and every time you walked down the street, people were like, Bruce Wayne, you'd probably stop going out so much. And um, and the idea would be that people would start to see him as this kind of recluse. And um, so that seemed like a like an interesting way to go. I started thinking of him kind of like a, I was listening to... Uh, uh, Nirvana when I was writing and I started thinking of him like a rock star like he was like he's kind of like a recluse rock star it made me think of people have said oh like you know you've said he's like Kurt Cobain and I didn't mean that Kurt Cobain is like Batman but what I did mean is that I think Kurt Cobain had a relationship to fame where being famous was not he loved music but the idea of being famous for music was maybe a, a double-edged sword and maybe wanted to kind of retreat for that so he's kind of a, a recluse and I thought that kind of rock edge um, was very appealing to me as a, as a different way to go. And that made me think of Rod Pattinson, actually. And so when we, when we met, um, I started writing the movie for him, actually, before I ever knew if he'd want to do it. And fortunately, he did want to do it. And working with him was great because he's such, a, he's such an inventive, thoughtful, interesting guy. And he always comes at stuff from a very uh, sort of non-traditional angle, something from a, from a side you don't expect. And so we did develop it further and trying to figure out like how this guy would be kind of in a kind of free fall. This is a guy who every time he goes out there, everyone he's fighting in his mind, he's really fighting the killers of his parents every night. So it's kind of like he's in this crazy sort of, you know, uh, shadow state where he's not really aware. He's very in this very un instinctive state and exploring that with Rob was great. And then uh, something that is very interesting too is like, uh you added to the story some like contemporary elements. I mean, stuff that might like uh, talk about situations that are taking place right now, like in a subtle way, right? For example, like, but Selena mentioned white privilege. Sure. There's something about the, the internet followers of one of the billions that people sure. might think, oh, this is create known and, and all of that. What's that kind of, risky sometimes or you wanted to do that you wanted specifically to do that to say this is not only like a movie just like a well, fiction what i wanted it to be because gotham the one thing about doing a batman story is that one of the major characters in batman story is gotham mm -hmm. and it's a corrupt place but for me the idea was that it needed to reflect our world and i think what was important 
was because I wanted it to be a story that would engage you emotionally and would make you feel like it, it related to something that connected to your life. You know, I wanted it to connect to my life. And so nothing was done in a way to be too direct. I didn't want it to be like, going, oh, they're doing that event. They're doing this event. But it was more to mm -hmm. feel like, oh, OK, I've never been to Gotham, but it does feel like Gotham is in our world. And I, I felt like that would make um, a version of this story that was relevant that felt like it that they could relate to and understand these characters and see them all struggling in a way that humanized them. So it was about humanizing the characters more than it was about being sort of issue oriented, you know, if that makes sense. It was a humanist kind of approach to try and make these characters be characters that had the kind of mythic quality because it's a it's a it's a superhero story, it's an enduring story from 80 years that has lasted because of its mythic elements, but then to humanize that so it becomes approachable, so that it was something that people felt related to their own experience. And visually, it's, the movie is very impressive. And of course, you have like at least two great directors that made their own like versions like that were like visual animation too. But here you have like, well, it's complicated because you have like action sequences, you have like a, a chase that kind of the French connection, you mentioned the French connection. Yeah. There, there's like the film noir aspect of it. So what's the lot for you to do? How, how was working with all of that? Was, like, was it like exciting, well, that scary? Was, was that like was the thrilling part. I mean, the, the thing about it is what I didn't expect because I'd never done, um, you know, it's a detective story. And so every clue matters. Like, you know, a lot of the movies have an aspect that sort of have one little detail of him being the world's greatest detective, but it's not the main story here. It was like, like you said, it's a policier in a way, like he and he and Gordon are, are sort of partners and they're swimming against a tide of corruption. And there's like, ch you know, grand scale chase that's like the French connection, but also there it's like a psychological thriller and a detective story. And so there was a lot of precise detail and the amount of that was overwhelming. But the texture of it was really thrilling because the movies that I kind of grew up on were those kind of 70s thrillers, you know, uh, like Friedkin movies, Scorsese movies, Alan Pakula, um, those kind of movies. And I wanted, I thought, oh, this would be really exciting to kind of take it and make this movie feel like it has a kind of visual iconography that relates to the comics. So it could feel mythic in that way, but also a grittiness that made it feel kind of like something out of the 70s and, and therefore made it feel very real and grounded. And that seemed really exciting to do. And that part was fun to do. So finally, what's next? There's going to be a sequel. You're going to be directing or not? <laughs> Can you talk about that? I mean, this is this is going to. This is, I mean, you're 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 very you're very involved in, in the thing because the studio gave you the chance to to write it and to create it. So you're probably interested in like doing something more, right? Yes. What's I think the first thing is a very long nap, um, <laughs> and and yeah. uh, and you know, look. Here's the thing. I my feeling in doing the film was always that. I would never treat it as chapter one because chapter one assumes that there are more chapters. And so what I wanted to do was to make this movie a satisfying experience so that people could experience a new f version, a fresh version of a character that they've loved, you know, that people that the world has loved for over 80 years. And I think if we succeed on that front, I know that I have a lot of stories that I want to tell and then we'll do chapter two, but not because we didn't make this one a complete experience. Um, and so, Let's just see what happens. Let's 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 let the audience watch it. I hope they connect to it. And if they do, then yes, there's definitely more to do. And I will not be napping for too long. <laughs> they will. They will for sure. Thank you very much, oh, cool. Matt. Thank, thank you. you for, thank you for this movie. Thank you for all your movies. And oh, thanks so much, Sergio. I appreciate that. Have a great day, sir. Bye. You too.